a few verses from the book of Revelation, chapter 3. The book of Revelation, chapter 3, and we're reading from verse number 14 through uh, to verse number 22. Revelation, chapter 3, and verse number 14. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou art cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and of need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I, am over, uh, as I also overcame and am sat down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches." Now, this was a letter that was sent from God through John the Apostle to the church at a place called Laodicea. And God was speaking to these people just as he had spoken to the six churches before that, because in chapter 2 and 3 of uh, Revelation, we have the seven letters to the seven churches. And when we turn to the Scripture, we must remember that there's only one true interpretation to every passage and to every text. And this was a message to the church at Laodicea. And so the fact that it was to the church means that it was the people of God, because that's who makes up the church. The church is composed not of bricks or mortar, but it's composed of people. And so he's writing to these people who were the church at Laodicea. And this church had got so taken up with themselves, so occupied with other things, that they had no place for the Lord. That's hard to imagine that uh, a church, a people who knew the Lord, and yet they had no time or place for the Lord. My, they were materially rich, but they were spiritually poor. And the Lord was outside on the periphery. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. So he's outside, and he appeals to the people to let him in, to crown him Lord of all. He appeals to them to make him central in their life. And that's the message to every Christian here tonight. My, if, if you've got cold, if your faith has dimmed, if you're not maybe as bright or enthusiastic as you used to be, Jesus Christ wants you to crown him Lord of all. Now, that's the true or the correct interpretation. But we want to make an application and we want to make an application in applying this to the gospel, because that's what this is, a gospel service, a gospel meeting. And of course, many gospel messages have been preached from verse 20 in this chapter, and uh, that's quite fine. Many gospel messages have been preached, but we want to look at it tonight uh, in a broader picture and take a broader picture of the whole passage. Looking at, at this from a gospel application, we get a picture of a poor lost sinner 
and a loving Savior. That's what we get in the application, a picture of a poor lost sinner and a loving Savior. Verse 14 makes it clear that the Lord is speaking. It says, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And there are some things that he said to these people, and we want to apply them to those in this meeting tonight who are without Christ. The first thing I saw as I looked at it from that angle was the condemnation from the Lord. He says this. He says, I know thy works. I know thy works. And before I go any further, let me say this tonight, that, that God knows all about you. And God knows all about me. He knows each one of us. There's nothing that we can hide from him. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou art cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You see, friends, he was speaking to these people about their present spiritual condition. And their present condition was unacceptable to the Lord. It was unacceptable to the Lord. In fact, he said, I will spew thee out of my mouth. He rejected them because of the condition of their heart. You know, Adam and Eve, my came with their fig leaves to the Lord. And it was unacceptable. Their, their fig leaves was unacceptable to God. And Cain came to the Lord with the fruit of his own hand, an offering, a sacrifice from the fruit of the ground, which was the work of his own hands. And what he was doing was he was, he was bringing God his good works. And he was hoping that his good works, that his, the labor of his own hands would be acceptable to God, and they were not acceptable to God. My dear friends, there were people, uh, and the Lord said this about them. He said, Many shall come on that day and say, Lord, Lord, we have, we have eaten and drank in thy name, and in thy name we have cast out devils and done many wonderful things. And behold, I will say unto them, Depart from me, ye cursed. I never knew you. And there's a people, you know, and they have done many things. They have sat at the table of remembrance. They have even sought to cast out demons. But my, the Lord says, I never knew you. I never knew you. My, they were unacceptable to the Lord. And these people that... God spoke to at Laodicea, the Lord was outside the door. They had no room for him in their heart. But you know, as God looks into your heart, men and women, tonight in this meeting, is your present condition acceptable or unacceptable to God? Because people are either in Christ or without Christ. It's one or the other. You're either in Christ or out of Christ. People are either in Christ or still in their sins. Is Jesus Christ outside the door of your heart tonight? Uh, can you go back to a place where you opened the door of your heart and received him as your own personal Savior, well, if that has never happened, then he's outside the door. Dear friends, we see the condemnation from the Lord. And then we come to verse 17 here, and we see the claims of the people. Thou sayest, he says, I am rich and increased with goods, and of need of nothing. In the first part of this verse, we see what they said about themselves. My, these people thought they were all right. They said, you know, we are rich. <clears throat> we are rich and increased with goods and of need of nothing. There was a, 
There was a self-sufficiency about them. My, they were blind to their own condition. They were like the Pharisee. Remember the Pharisee and the publican that came up to the temple to pray? And the Pharisee prayed, and he said, Lord, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, uh, extortioners, adulterers, or unjust, or even as this, this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And you see, friends, this man, this man called the Pharisee, thought that he was all right. He looked at the, at the publican and thought to himself, you know what, well, I'm better than him. I'm better than him. And maybe you're here tonight and you think you're all right. Maybe you think your life is okay. Maybe you look at other people, and we're good at looking at other people, aren't we? We're good at judging ourselves by other people. You look at other people, and you say, well, you know, I don't drink or smoke. I don't curse. I don't gamble. I'm a, a good church attender. I give money to the church. I give tithes of all that I possess. And you say to yourself, well, you know, I'm, I'm okay. Dear friends, dear friends, these people thought that they were all right, and they thought that they're church going, their moral character, their uprightness will make them acceptable to God. And they say, you know, we're all right. Maybe you're here tonight and you say to yourself, you know, I'm, I'm okay. I'm all right. But in the second part of the verse, we see what God thought about them. They said, I'm rich and increased with goods and of need of nothing. And the Lord said, knowest thou not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind, and naked. And this is the condition of the people. We see the condemnation of the people, and the claims of the people, and this is the condition of the people. My God said, listen, you're wretched. These people who said we're rich and increased with goods, and of need of nothing, and because of the condition of their heart, the Lord said, you're wretched. Neither good works were as filthy rags. And that's something that self-righteous people need to think about. I know many people, and they are depending on their good works and their church going and their membership. The Bible says that in God's sight, these things are as filthy rags. God says you're wretched. You're not all right at all. You're wretched, that's what you are. And miserable. Their efforts and their attitude were miserable. And he says, you're poor. These people, my said, we have need of nothing. But when God looked into their heart, God says, listen, you're poor. You're poor. Yes, they had nothing that was acceptable to God. They were poor, lost sinners. And when we came into this world, we come in with nothing. We come in in nakedness, and we come in as poor lost sinners who are powerless and helpless to save themselves. And God said, listen, you're blind. My, these people were blind to their own condition. And how many people there are today, and they're blind to their own condition. They cannot see that they're lost. They cannot see that they're sinners. They cannot see that they need to be saved. They cannot see their need. And God says, listen, you're not only that, but you're naked. They were exposed to God's all-seeing eye. And dear friend, tonight God sees us as we are. God looks in and he looks at my heart and he looks at your heart, and God sees us as we are. He sees our sinfulness. He sees our self-righteousness. He sees the condition of our heart tonight. And my dear friends, we see the condemnation of these people, and the claims, and the condition of these people. And then we see the counsel of the Savior here, because he says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, White raiment that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, 
and anoint thine eyes with thy salve, that thou mayest see. The Lord speaks to these people about their condition, and he counsels them, he gives them advice. And he says, you know, I counsel thee to buy of me gold. He counsels them to be rich. God wanted them to be rich in a different way to what they were rich. God wanted them to be, to be, to, to be rich toward God. To be rich toward God. You remember the rich young ruler, or the, the, rich, the rich farmer? And, 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 and my God came and said, Tonight shall I be with me in paradise. And this man was not rich, it says, towards God. My dear friends, tonight are you rich towards God? You might say to me, what does that mean? That just means, my, to be rich towards God, you're clothed in the righteousness of God, you have salvation, your sins are forgiven, my, you have, you have redemption through his blood, my, you have been reconciled to him, you're heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. Heaven is your eternal resting place. And my, that person is rich. You may have much that would make you rich towards man, but you're rich towards God. And he counseled them to be righteous. This is not self-righteousness. This is righteousness obtained from God, and he counsels them uh, to anoint their eyes with eye salve that they might see. And then he says, repent, repent. The Lord called upon this people whose hearts was not acceptable to him, he called upon them to repent, called upon these people to turn from their present condition and give themselves to him. And the Lord calls upon men and women tonight, not only here in Kilkeel, but in, in Bombridge and Rath Island and Newcastle and across our land, he calls upon them to repent and to turn from their sinful ways and to receive him into their lives. Dear friends, that's the call of the gospel. We need to get back to repentance. People need to repent. My, to, to turn away from their sinful life and their sinful ways. And they need to receive the Savior into their heart as their own personal Savior. And then he says to them this, he says, I call upon thee to repent. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be therefore zealous and repent. And then he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. And this is the compassion of the Savior. These people had no time and no place for the Lord. The Lord was outside the door of their heart, the door of their life. And yet we find that the one whom they rejected was the one who was knocking at the door of their heart and seeking admission. The one that they rejected was the one who was standing at the door of their heart and seeking their admission. First thing we see about the Lord here is his love. He says, as many as I love. You know, the one who loved them, the one who loved them was knocking at the door of your heart, of their heart. And dear friends, the Lord is knocking at the door of your heart tonight because he loves you. Because he loves you. There's one who loves you tonight. His name is Jesus. And because he loves you, he's seeking admission. Yes. And you know, the one who's standing at the door of your heart tonight, the door of your life tonight, seeking admission. He's a seeking Savior, a seeking Savior. He wants to come in. 
He wants you to open the door and invite him. We read in this book that the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. My, there's a seeking Savior tonight, and he's seeking for those that are lost and for those that are perishing, and for those whose hearts are stained with sin. And the one who stands at the door of your heart tonight, seeking admission and knocking, he's a speaking Savior, a speaking Savior. It says, if any man hear my voice, because as the Lord knocks, he speaks to you. God speaks in many ways. Yes, He speaks through his word. He speaks through messages and song. He speaks through distribution of tracts, personal evangelism. He speaks through the preacher. He speaks through circumstances. He speaks through tragedy. Wonder, have you heard his voice? Wonder, have you heard that knock at the door of your life? I wonder... How have you been concerned about your soul? Uh, have you been moved? That's God speaking to you by His Spirit. The one who stands at the door of your heart seeking admission, He's a seeking Savior and He's a speaking Savior. And you know, friends, He's a suffering Savior. Because the fact that He's at the door of your life My dear friends, the one who knocks at the door of your heart tonight, my, his hands are scarred with the nail prints. He has nail prints in his hands when they nailed him to that tree. Because of his love for you and me, he willingly and voluntarily went to that tree at Calvary, that old blood-stained rugged cross, and there they crucified him, lifted him up to die. And on that cross he gave his life and shed his precious blood, and he suffered the just for the unjust. That's why I like that last piece. That speaks of the one who gave his life for us, gave his life for me. Oh, dear friends, and shed his blood to pay redemption's price. And the one who speaks to you tonight in this meeting is the one who cried, it's finished. It's finished. The one who stands at the door of your heart tonight, seeking admission. He's a seeking Savior, and a speaking Savior, and a suffering Savior, And bless God, he's a sufficient Savior, a sufficient Savior. The fact that he's at the door tells us that the cross could not hold him, nor the tomb could not hold him, but it tells us that he rose again when he appeared to his disciples. My, on that first Easter Sunday, he showed them his hands and his feet, and they beheld the wounds in his hands and his feet. And my, they said all that needed to be said, that he had conquered sin and conquered the grave and was alive, a living Savior who was able to save those that would come unto God by him. Dear friends, the one who stands at the door of your heart tonight seeking admission, he's a seeking Savior and a speaking Savior, and a suffering Savior, and a sufficient Savior. And I want to tell you this, he's a soon-coming Savior, because that same one is coming again, and he's coming soon. And we look around our world today, and we see the chaos. And we look at Syria and Iraq, and we see my uh, the whole world is in a mess, and it's not getting any better, it's getting worse. And the day is fast approaching when the blessed Son of God will come and receive from the world his own, and he's coming for those that are ready, whose whose names are in the Lamb's book of life, whose, whose hearts are cleansed by precious blood. 
He's coming for those that belong to him and know him. Dear friend, tonight, as we come to the end of this meeting, are you like these people who have shut Christ out of your life? Like these people that we've read about here, who maybe think, you know, we're all right. We're all right. We're not too bad. People who think they're good enough as they are. I have to tell you tonight, you're not good enough as you are. Oh, that you might realize tonight that you need the Savior, that you need cleansing, that you need redemption. May you realize that the Lord of glory is knocking at the door this evening, seeking admission. And he wants to come in to be your Savior. My, these people were not acceptable to God in their present condition. They were not acceptable. And if you're here tonight without Christ, you're not acceptable to God in your present condition. You need to come. You need to be saved. You need to be redeemed. You need to receive Christ as your Savior. May you open the door. May you say yes to Jesus. On this night, I'm coming. On this day, I'm trusting the Lord as my Savior. Don't put it off. It's easy to put things off, even in the normal run of life. It's, able, it's so easy to put things off from today to tomorrow, what we could do today. Don't put it off, friends. Open the door of your heart tonight and ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice. Do you hear his voice tonight? Have you been hearing his voice? If any man hear his voice and open the door. Will you open the door? And he gives you this promise, I will come in. Sup with him. Tea with me. I remember the day or the night as a young man of 18 years of age. I opened the door. Said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I don't deserve to be saved. But I believe that there at Calvary you shed your blood and you died for me. You loved me and died for me. And here and now, I accept thee as my own personal Savior. And when I opened the door, do you know what happened, friend? He came in. He hasn't changed. He's still the same. May God challenge our hearts tonight. Speak to every heart. Maybe you're a believer here tonight. Things have got so busy and you've crammed your life full of so many things but you've lost your first love. You've lost your first love. You've become lukewarm. You've become maybe a backslider. If you're a backslider here tonight, my, the Lord is the God of the backslider. He wants to bring you back. He wants you to come back to him. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, he wants to bring you in and save you and make you his. May God speak to our hearts. Move in your life for his dear name's sake. Amen.